Yeah, it's a fifty percent. So, yeah, so I have all three degrees in mechanical engineering, and uh, just sort of want to say that whether you're a biologist or a biological oceanographer or a chemist or a chemical oceanographer or in physics or an engineer, uh, you know, air, water, gas transfer is ubiquitous. It's, you know, within your lungs, as you all know, and it's sitting right outside in um, this water body. It's really dark. Can we turn, like, the lid? Turn, turn the rear light on. I want to, uh, I, I'll start. It's up to you. I can, I can work in the dark. Is that uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a little better? Yeah. Thank you. So since, so I, so I have uh, worked with Ryan for um, over two years now, and since I uh, accepted this talk, I've worked with uh, two people um, in this room, uh, both uh, Frank Miller Carter and uh, Tim Short, uh, within a, a couple of months' time frame since being here today. All right. So um, the talk will be as it says, it's sort of a, a, a ubiquitous talk on air, water, gas transfer and all these systems. Here's a cartoon that sort of shows it better than I can say. We'll go through some of those things. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that and some of the processes as a, a primer and then kick into what we're doing with the gas exchange and IC systems. So um, we'll go back to this one, but you can see this was built sort of before I did corals and before ocean acidification, this uh, picture was uh, made. But you can see some of the common terms that we deal with in environmental and marine and atmospheric sciences. Everything from the physical processes, like evaporation and the heat transfer, solar radiation, um, infrared radiation. But looking at some more detailed mechanisms that control air, water, gas transfer, you start looking at wind is a big one. Uh, looking at the wind causing waves is a big one. The wind and waves and currents causing turbulence is a big one. So really, when we go through this, if you don't know what controls gas transfer, and if you don't know after this talk, think about the CO2 gas bubbles in your beer, because you should all know what's going on with the gas transfer at some level. Some of you may be experts, some of you may be just introductory. So we'll go back to this uh, slide. So I want to start the talk at the beginning where we call the talk Air Water Gas Transfer in Ice, with Ice, trying to look at the right appropriate title. I'm Wade McGillis. I am now at Columbia University, Lamont Dory Earth Observatory, but I spent my postdoc where I became a mechanical engineer to this stuff at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. <coughs> Who here has seen the University of Miami Rasmus Wind Wave Tank Facility? Three, come on, raise your hands, because this is important. I know not to direct it towards you. Four. Four? Okay, that's a really tight space. Did you go in there together? It's tight, yeah? So, tank experiments to simulate essentially waves and gas exchange. So, an important part of, of what I do and what this field has done is really trying to figure out what controls how gas, whether it's in the water or in the air, gets in and out of it. Some gases are preferential, some go both ways. So in this tank, this was built at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with a guy named Nelson Frew, did surfactants, where he coated them on the surface, and I'll show some results in the intro on that. So basically, I want to, in case you don't miss it, there's a fan humming around in the top. It's a vane. It's an annular flume spinning around on top, and there's 10 centimeters of water surface. You can use that as a scale. So one way to do this is to pump up the water with oxygen or a chemical that you can measure very easily in the water, and then put nitrogen in the headspace, and then just do a mass balance, and we'll look at, and look at how fast that oxygen evades into the nitrogen headspace, and from that, you can figure out the kinetics of the system. So the kinetics of the systems are controlled by these processes. Ones that I really want to look at, um, this is you know, in a, a deeper ocean system, a lot of things that we're doing now is looking at shallow flows. But one take home message is it's all about a very small layer at the surface. It's the mass aqueous diffusion boundary layer. What erodes that, what makes it small, what makes it big, and what controls that gradient. It's a physical barrier and it has to have being mixed to make it smaller. When it's smaller, you have the same diffusion and you can get gas across it easier. 
So some of the mechanisms that we will look at, I'm going to pick a couple. One is surfactants, wind of course. Then you have waves and another one that we'll take a quick look at is precipitation and then most of the talk will be on the ice field. So just an explanation of, of the way we can break down gas exchange. Uh, I dealt mostly with, with CO2, so I interchange between the gas and carbon dioxide. But we're after um, a surface flux. So the surface flux is how many moles or grams, the global warming thing, how much coming out of smokestacks, well, going into the atmosphere, how much is going into the terrestrial biosphere, how much is coming out of cement, how much is going in and out of the ocean. So in order to get that number, whether it's a regional, whether it's in your fish tank, whether it's in this bay, or whether it's the global ocean, whether it's in the Arctic, where you have ice. Does it ever have ice here, ever? Never. Okay, so in order to get that surface in for a budget or for an ecological process, you can break it down for water systems to the kinetic term, which is the K in this top equation, and the gas difference, which is CO2. So we have the luxury, unlike in the biosphere system, where you can actually get the flux by measuring the CO2 in the bulk water, CO2 in the bulk air, and knowing what the kinetics are. So most of my time is spent just looking at the physics of that K. If you can get that term, then you just can go out and measure chemically the difference and get the flux. Sorry if everyone knows that to death, but those of you who don't know, that's how we're spelling it out. So we're looking at the physical processes that control K. One is how it behaves in ice. And then uh, delta PCO2, um, not a, a, about this talk, but that's a main driver, half as much, maybe even more important in terms of the biological and chemical and physical processes that control that CO2. And then really, what's the wide range of physical and biological conditions that control um, that flux equation. I'm going to show this one really quick. This is a construction of Taro Takahashi's global CO2 map. For those of you who have not seen it, green is when the atmosphere is in equilibrium, or the ocean is in equilibrium with the atmosphere. The reds are when CO2 is high in the water and it's coming out, like look at the equatorial Pacific. Blues and purples are sinks. When you have phytoplankton blooms and, or when you're in the higher latitudes, those are our sink regions. Um, I, I, sh I show it just because the concoction here, whether again, I, I really want to bring home, whether it's in a small estuary or a river or the global ocean, it's important where that driving force for the chemical gradient, if you look at the physics that's specific to that system, you can then get the flux. So here's a, a laundry list. We're gonna, we're gonna start going now into it. Here's a laundry list of those processes that I personally have studied, I think, except one on this list. So wind and waves, big driver, primary, primary forcer, unless you're um, in a vacuum of sorts. Uh, bubbles, lots of energetics. You know, another surface area causes more mixing. Spray that's generated in the atmosphere. Turbulence can be caused by an interaction of waves, breaking waves, current fields, large-scale Langmuir motions, uh, buoyancy caused by heat fluxes. Chemical enhancement is a very near-surface chemical exchange. Surfactants are a physical thing. I'm going to show an example of that. Buoyancy and atmospheric stability. You can imagine if you have a neutral um, system of water, you start extracting um, heat or, or cooling it, you're going to start generating mixing from that process, and that process is going to cause a modulation of that boundary layer in the water that's going to affect that gas exchange. Rain and dilution. I'm going to show an example of that, but you can imagine rain, lots of energetics and mixing when it hits the surface. Carbonic anhydrase, Seuss effect, evaporation condensation, magnetic fields, and rivers. Here's the example. So this was, was my bridge from an engineering system to the ocean. It's surfactants. <clears throat> surfactants are big, I'm going to say, in the bay when you have a lot of anthropogenic inputs, oils, whether in natural phytoplankton, exudate. These things want to get out of the water and sit on the surface. If you ever seen an oily surface, it starts to clear waves damp. That's a, that's a physical effect. And I, I, I don't have uh, the space to show that in a slide, but you can imagine essentially dampening um, a wave in, in the motions and turbulence. So it's all about when you have a fluid flow at the surface of the water, you have to take me for, for granted here, that fluid flow in the absence of anything on it, say it's a free surface, 
doesn't have any resistance to shear, so it's just going to go. And when it just goes, upwelling water that's very close to that layer can get up to the surface, so the gas exchange is high. If you put on a surfactant or a film, like oil or soap films, the reason why this works is that you try and push a soap film, it compresses, and you have a change in the surface tension at the surface, and that causes it to be resist, so it's like hitting a wall. So even though the free surface is, is a wall, it's only a wall in one dimension. If you have a film on it, it fe feeds back anymore. And, and this is a numerical you know, measurement that shows that effect. This one here is when we've completely cleaned the surface. And this is sort of getting into the ammunition that I used to describe gas exchange. It's that K value. So that K value, this is done in, in a tank where we control the surfactant levels really closely. The K value is measuring the flux. This is done by a mass balance of oxygen. And then measuring the gradient of the oxygen. So if you go back to well, the top equation, where you have the flux equals K delta C, if I measure the flux in the tank, divided by the concentration difference, I get the K. So the line that goes straight up on top, that's for fresh, clean water. So when I increase the wind speed, you have a corresponding K. When you add more and more surfactants, which is going down a very small amount. I mean, this is such small micromolar. It's a triton, which is actually a, it spreads film chemicals it used to before digital cameras. And uh, so a very, very small amount suppresses waves and turbulence, suppresses gas exchange for the given wind speed. You add a lot. And this value here is kind of like what the East Coast coastal waters can have. And this is in, in a laboratory tank. But when you add 1 times 10 to the minus 6 micromolars of triton, you suppress it. And then for very, very high wind speeds, keep it, this is a, almost like a flat surface boundary layer case, no waves. Mm -hmm. And then it finally can take off when you break down the resistance of the wave field. So again, demonstrating how something other than wind controls gas exchange. In this case, surfactants, which are, are out in the natural environment or in engineering systems. <coughs> So uh, the next one is rivers with a, uh, I want to uh, crank this one. This is a, get water So in a river system, you have the, the water running down, and the mixing is generated by turbulence on the bottom of the river. I, I, uh, I was underwater and for, it, it, it seemed like about a half a minute. And I was uh, seeing light. And I typically was supposed to go across the river, but then I decided to return going back. The purpose of that slide is to lighten you up a little bit. The second one is to show you who you're dealing with. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the, yeah, that is me. Uh, you can be happy that I was saved to be here today. Uh, but the, but the, the serious note is that you're not going to see the data of this, but we have this great paper done in a small intertidal river where there's no wind, you know, there's no wind here. There's no trees either in Haiti. But uh, to see it, like, you could call that, it's a bush. But, uh, you know, that mixing just causes enormous amounts of gas transfer. Okay, last example before we get to ice. It's a good one. It's rain. So rain is a good one because since you don't have ice and snow here, you have rain. So you will appreciate this one more. And you can imagine when rain hits a surface, it penetrates it, you know, what's happening? A lot of different things happening depending on the rain, the, the rain rate and length of time. <coughs> so top image that you're, you're gonna see, and I'll explain what's happening and where this is done. It's an infrared image about a meter on the side of a rain field that's starting right now. So you had, you had essentially uh, a cold, cool surface, and when the rain hits, you know, you basically have a cool skin going on. This is in biosphere out in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. It seems like all the natural systems we do in experiments in the, in the tank. But um, this system, we were able to rain on seawater, and it's repeating here, when it rains, the warm fluid jets start coming up. 
So it's really going right after that surface boundary layer to cause gas exchange. What's different about this example is, is there's a combined effect of what I call a surface dilution, changing the carbon system. So when you have rain, it's only being equilibrated with the atmosphere, and it has essentially very low DIC, I don't know, you know, depending where it's close to a city in terms of the alkalinity. When that hits the surface, you're hitting you know, enormous amounts of DIC and alkalinity, but it dilutes. And the point is that the whole carbonate system equations change, not just by volume of <coughs> salinity dilution. And here's just, the, here's just the, the salinity dilution. So here's time versus depth. And as the rain comes in, it's being diluted by the rain, that, that seawater, okay? So observations of that in the field is from a, a near surface buoy. Here's a, a precipitation event. And when that precipitation event happens, it causes a dilution in the surface layer. So if you, we, you know, we've constructed models to try and figure out the penetration depth of that. But the point of this is that it's not considered in global gas exchange or in any gas exchange because it's a very near surface phenomenon. It's kind of like looking at a, a near surface mixing layer where they have all these parameterizations at the surface for heating and, and for, there is a rain value in there, but not for the chemical effect of dilution. So what's going on there is you're increasing the gas exchange and you're changing the chemical properties. And let's see how that happens. This is the chemical properties. So when you compute that salinity effect in, in, the, in a little bit of uh, equilibrated atmospheric DIC, CO2, that's going to the surface layer, very near surface layer, if you can convert that to the new DIC with, with the mixing, you get a suppression. Uh, this was done in a, a wave field with rain all the way across it, so you have waves, wind, and rain. And what Emily Harrison from the University of Delaware just showed with us, here is, I think, a Gowanikoff relationship. And when you add more and more uh, rain effects, the higher and more rain rates, you essentially increase that K. This is like lots of surfactants, so it's like the reverse effect, right? So when you add rain, you're increasing the mixing, and your K goes up, especially at low wind fields. And just like you know, the, the, the trend with the surfactants, when you increase the wind, wind kind of like takes over the whole story. So they all converge no matter what rain rate in terms of mixing. So that's the physical part. Combine that with the chemical parts. And you get, this is an example of the response of that. So this is taking real ocean CO2 in the Western Equatorial Pacific and real winds and using the co combined formulation of this dilution effect that we invented and the uh, wave effect and the rain effect where that, that physical part, when you combine the two, you get an interesting response. And if, if I'm just gonna show a couple of the trend lines and explain it, and if you get it or not, we're gonna move on to ice no matter what. So here's the time series. Um, I actually didn't have the beginning rain, so we didn't start there. The first line is green. So green is wind only. So using a canonical uh, gas transfer parameterization, wind only. So what happens is, uh, what's in here is the concentration field of CO2, and this is over the annual, and the wind. So here's an accumulation of the flux of CO2. It goes up, and then there must be a sink, so it starts to go down. That's green. The next one is just using rain physics only, which is, so a lot of times we don't use anything with the rain, we just use wind. But when we add the rain physics, it's just the kinetics. So when you add higher kinetics because of the rain, you're going to get a higher value, so it's always up. So if you use just the physical component of the rain gas exchange, you're going to say it goes up. But what happens when you have dilution, no matter what, your flux goes down, because you're always diluting it. Even if you have some CO2 in there, you're going to drop it even further, so you're going to always make it more of a sink, even if it's a source. The point is that it goes up, but then you start to have a, de a decline. And so this effect is, is significant, especially in a region where you have lots of rain. <coughs> the bottom line is just showing this um, line here, the DIC, that flux basically is a scrubbing wet deposition where you're taking CA CO2 DIC in the rain. It's just, it's just saying this is much rain, this is the DIC in the rain, you put it into the water, it has to go there. So that's a, that's a, a sink. 
That's a sink term, no matter what. And then the other one is the uh, DO, there's DOC in the atmosphere as well. All right, as you just saw, we're going to move to rain. But those are just some examples where you had a surfactant perturbation from the wind. You had, uh, well, rivers. And then you had uh, rain perturbations from the wind, just three examples. And now we're going to open up and look what we find with ice. There's nothing special about the soundtrack on this one. Uh, but uh, it's basically just a dome on a green roof in Manhattan. Uh, the, point, the point of it is just another method to measure a flux often used in ice fields where you put the dome over, you look at the accumulation or depletion of your gas like CO2 and you can get the flux. But I want to um, turn down the volume. Yeah, you connect and then stop. It may be in the middle of a measurement. If it's in the middle of a measurement, you have to let it finish before you can stop the equation. <laughs> And then you go to utilities, file manager. <laughs> and her name is Nadine. Okay, so uh, there is belief of real evidence of enhanced CO2 exchange in ice. Um, you know, people some say some of my papers are wrong. Well, this paper is probably wrong too, in terms of the amount of fluxes that they got. But the point is that. A lot of people are after, when you have these different types of ice flows, you have different winds, and you have different water systems underneath, what is the new gas exchange? That's the question. And so you have buoyancy. When you have a salty system, we'll look at how that ice is formed, but it just doesn't make a solid sheet skating rink like a freshwater system, so you have these little channels of brine, which are intense you know, incubators for CO2 reactions, but do you have gas exchange through those? How big are the open fields? Where is the interaction with all the turbulence mechanisms, just like the rain and surfactants on that surface flow field? So there's enormous amounts of different kinds of ice, and there's also uh, St. Pete no ice. But uh, so there's nucleation. You can imagine right when, uh, you know, so there are freezers, so we all, we all know what ice cubes look like when they get frozen. but when you have nucleation on the surface, you always have to have a, you bring down the temperature for freezing to take place. That freezing point is different for fresh water and, and amount of different amounts of salt water. But when that nucleation happens, it grows, and then it causes heat release. So maybe there's a, uh, you know, a reject process where that nucleation may um, essentially melt. So there's a little actuating taking place. Do you have an enhancement during that process? Then you have ice chunks, and if you have interactions, and I'll show a couple of different picture, pictures of how ice gets formed, you get very different types of ice. It's like slushy ice, block ice, nucleation ice. So there, there's a wide range of fields to describe um, this condition. So how we started off. Um, in the basement, <coughs> in the core lab at Lamont Doherty, I started with a little uh, called R2D2 shape. Basically, it's just a cylinder of water, repeated the same thing that we did in this wind wave tank, where you make, well, in that case here, I charge it up with oxygen as well, and then I voided the headspace of, uh, of oxygen with just with nitrogen, and then started to freeze. Caused some mixing with pumps underneath. So this experiment was simulated, it's not a rainforest case, it doesn't have surfactants on there, probably does, but there, it's a, not really a wave system, and started to look at how gas is being transferred. These pictures are uh, from a paper led by Bryce Luce, who did his PhD on this topic, where he made a bigger R2D2 at uh, the, the Army Cold Research Laboratory. So same experiment, but he added SF6 uh, to the oxygen as well. So again, try to look at these rates in just a 1D system with some pumps and pump stirring. So, uh, pictures by Chris Zappa, who looks at surfaces with infrared cameras. Just want to show what the crystals like in the infrared flow field in the fresh water. So they're very um, spindly, and the surfaces are nice and smooth when they start to grow. And that's basically a, a complete system. So again, the, the ice crystals grow out, they form um, very uniformly. In the seawater, you have uh, dendrites. You can imagine, so when you start to form ice in seawater, you have a freezing front, and that freezing system front 
only the, the water freezes. And what gets rejected is the ice and some gases. So when you just have water and gases and salt, the front edge of that freezing system is going to have a higher concentration of salt. So while it's freezing, it's going to say, oop, I can't freeze anymore because I just depressed the freezing point because I have more salt in front of me. So it has to go around. So it ends up creating a surface that is, is not so smooth. It has a lot of dendrites and, and, and crystal formation. So the only other different part of this is besides it being colder, besides it having uh, fronts of, of, of rejected gas, rejected salt, different kinds of temperature below that ice, it also has um, vertical structures, uh, brine channels, because of this process where you just can't freeze it, solidify because of this concentration of ice and a suppression of the freezing point. And that's the ice surface in the, the seawater. Okay, so now going into the, the data, looking at the ice flow um, in, a, in, in a system uh, you know, of these mass balance. So this is actually using four oxygen sensors. And then, uh, you know, I'm just showing off here. Uh, these are four oxygen sensors that are showing the response. And just the, you know, the fluorescence oxygen sensors can be made so that they just like line up um, without changing their mm -hmm. calibration curves. If you just have, you know, essentially their offset calibration, these sensors um, just are, are terrific. Especially in a time series where you're just looking at the, uh, the time rate of change, uh, which ends up being a log with, uh, with uh, time. So you measure the oxygen um, at the surface in the air, and the oxygen in the water, this is the time series. So this is a mass balance, and you solve for the gas transfer coefficient, K, Mm -hmm. And that's the height. So this trend, just looking at the time rate of change of, of temperature, you can get from this one-dimensional um, ordinary differential equation, the gas exchange rate. So um, looking at that, here is the, that gas exchange rate um, in time in, in one of the buckets. And the, the point essentially made here is that here's the gas exchange with an open system. It's only you know, about 20 centimeters in diameter. With a pump on, gas exchange rate of about five, stays fairly uh, constant, and then when it freezes, it caps off, and here you have a negative, and that negative could be some um, gas rejection, which is causing artifact. But the main point that I wanted to make with this is there really is an enhancement when it comes close to freezing, which is like the, the small-scale nucleation um, theory, which why I started looking at it. So there was no effect with that. This is the small scale actuators that I thought was going after the surface microlayer. The other one is it's really cold. When it's really cold, solubility may increase, which is bringing gas to the surface, but the mass diffusion across that boundary layer in the water surface is, is so small because molecules just have a hard time um, penetrating and migrating through that system that your um, gas exchange is low. So when you correct for like 660, which is a normal temperature gas exchange rate, it pops up, so it's all it's, it's about 1.8 difference in the gas exchange just because of your loss of diffusivity um, in that cold system. So here becomes more of the interesting start of what we want to explore. Um, this is a, a, in the same tank, but looking at different concentrations of ice field. So one um, of the characteristics, first of all, um, F0 is no water. So this is when you have pure ice. This is when you have pure water. One is pure water. So when you start having, um, here, here's the, uh, the data from the experiment with different kinds of pump fields um, and energetics in the system. When you start having a little bit of openings, you start having an enhancement over this one-to-one -one line. Now the one-to-one -one line is if you just assume that your gas exchange is partitioned based on your area uh, of your open system, which is what essentially what a Takahashi um, system does. He just basically applies a gas transfer relationship on the area. But what we find is that in this case here, there was an enhancement and with a radon uh, budget in the Antarctic, there was an enhancement as well. So there really wasn't some open, open water system study here. So this spawned um, two new investigations. 
before I mention that, I just want to say one of the findings was that when you have essentially the pure ice and these brine channels, what comes up is that essentially the, the diffusion becomes really, really small. And what that is, is here's the airfield atmosphere. Here's the water system. The brine channels that get created, you know, essentially looking at the mass balance, it's just really small. So you can, when you have a pure ice field, assume in terms of gas exchange it to be zero or very, very small. The difference is when you have some openings and then afterwards when some of this melts, the storage from any biological activity in there can, um, can be massive. So we're going to jump to two sets of experiments. That's the data. So this is a top view of, uh, at, of the uh, small tank in two degree C room. Spinning around, you can see, it's looking down, there's a plexiglass plate at the surface, and that's the weight fields being generated. The right hand view is putting it at minus 15 and having a solid surface and not having uh, any system because it's completely solid surface. We're going to look at the in between now. But I just want to say you know, this is the experiment that I conducted where I'm going to look at as the surface goes from a purely open system to one that is purely covered in the gas exchange. So, now that I've done it, said it a couple times, the way I can do it in that small enclosed system in an annular tank, annular tank is kind of nice because the, the wave field is the same along the whole system. In a linear tank, for those of you who have seen, if they turn the wind on for you at the Rasmus wind wave field, there's no waves at the beginning because the fetch is zero, and then by the end you have quite steep waves as the waves grow. But this one is nice because it's, it's, it's actually symmetric and just keeps on flowing. There's some radial artifacts, but there's, they can be small. So what I processed here is this is just in terms of time. So I looked at the gas exchange rate from the mass balance in that water as a function of time. I can do a, a rolling um, calculation to look at K because I know the delta C and I know the flux. So I look at that gas exchange as you go in time and <coughs> as you go in time it start, cranks up and then it falls down. So here's, here's an uh, in-between where you start having a lot of the ice crystals that are forming on the side. The ice crystals forming on the side and the, my belief here, and looking at some of the evidence, is that when the ice starts to get formed, it starts creating other surfaces and rebounds and causing mixing of, and sort of macroscopic mixing and tearing down that boundary layer. So what I start off with is pure water, and then when I start to have more and more ice being formed, it cranks up and then it starts to shut down to zero. Here's the temperature of the water. So here it comes close to freezing, and then here you have a suppression of temperature. This is a, the temperature field. And you have a suppression of temperature, and the ice gets formed, and then once ice gets formed, it uh, plateaus to zero degrees C. This is fresh water, so that's why it's zero degrees C and not like minus 1.9. So I, I took that response and converted it to, instead of just time, I converted it to an approximation of what the open area is. So we can, can translate it to the same results that we had before, where you look down, you have a certain amount of area, fraction of open, a certain amount of area that is ice. And from that, now you have <coughs> pure ice. So you start out, the experiment actually starts over here, we have pure water, and it goes up, as you have 80, 60 percent, or 20 or 40 percent ice cover, when you have 100 percent ice cover, or zero percent open water, okay? So here is pure ice, here is pure water. Pure ice is close to zero, as we discussed, just the brine channels, and there's no brine channels when it's fresh water. Here, the gas exchange, when you have pure water at that wind speed. So when you, if you, if you reverse now in terms of the measurements, as you open up more and more water, you, have, you are able to cause um, these energetics of the physical system. There's a, there's a dotted line, just a, a side note. That dotted line is a correction for the gases that get rejected when the ice gets formed. So there's a, a, a correction to account for the change in oxygen just caused by 
the gas exchange. Because when that ice forms, it rejects salt. There's no salt in fresh water, but it also rejects the gas, so it will have an, an increase that's an artifact. And the last line, it's on a different kind of skew, but that's the pure water, that's pure ice, and then in between is that uh, diagonal where if you assumed that the gas exchange was just a, a linear um, summation of, of the zero and the pure water, then you were supposed to get the pink, but we see an enhancement above that. This is a substantial amount. could be a very energetic system, but the point is it corroborates some of those in corroborates some of the enhancement of the in-situ gas exchange and the enhancement of um, ice experiment. One really cool thing to sort of annihilate any of the ice effects is I, uh, I blew up a lot of balloons with, uh, with water and essentially spun the balloons simulating them as ice flows and the reason why I did this is they are permeable, impermeable to gas exchange. They're, look, they're simulating ice. This is when they're completely packed. You can see a little bit of, of openings. And this is sort of ice for Florida. And it's also ones that you essentially can do it for a long time and have it in control. The problem is, is that I get, my fingers start to get raw because these, these were only you know, about a little over an inch and I had to, to tie them. So I did one case where there was no balloons, which is here. That's a pure open water. So this is a superposition of the results we just looked at with the balloon ice flows where, this is funnier than, than it is, but uh, it, it's well done. But I only did a couple of points. I was only able to get a little bit over, um, a little bit less than 20% of balloon coverage to simulate that. And then I was able to get you know, a little bit more than 50%. So you see what, what's happening here? So I'm simulating those blocks of ice and whether turbulence is really happening or if there's this artifact from me not being able to deal with, with gas rejections in the system. So, and uh, Tim, this is kind of like the big, we, you were there with the big chunks of ice, right? Okay, this is like the big chunks of ice. So anyways, this corroborates that the enhancement looks real. This was done last May and I haven't had a chance to do any more work. Uh, part of it is that we spent five months um, in the next experiment. This was a precursor, precursor to it. So the next, yes sir? Is the fracking, the area fracking? This one here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this, this is really against intuition. Yeah. But if this curve is true, it means depending on how you calculate the total, you have a different answer. If, if half of the table is occupied by ice, well, well, half well, is water. well there's, only, there's only one result, so it depends on, on the way I calculated this. Oh, you mean that you can have different areas, <coughs> is what you're saying? If half is ice, yeah. half is water, yeah. the answer depends on... You, if you the spacing, the spacing. Right, what, spacing. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're right, and it's part of the thing that we have challenges that we have to deal with. If you have an answer to, to you know, reduce that to another parameter, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about, so the, the answer to your question in terms of what we did, is you need another uh, characteristic to describe it. In this one here, I tried to make the uh, spacings uniform. So this, this compaction um, didn't happen. I, I typically tried to make all the little ducks separated by the same amount. But what you're talking about is you have ice flows, you know, you can have ice flows that have, I think that we all want to say that this fraction percent is uniform. So the openings are uniform fractically, you know, over your whole system. The other one is what we call a lead with just one opening where given the surface area, you still have the same opening you know, the fractional area, but one's a lead where all of the opening is one space versus distributed uniformly. And we, we basically conducted that experiment in the next, in the next facility. But it's, it's, it's definitely 
one that we have a challenge you know, with and uh, you know, we, we have to define it. And in some ways, you know, first of all, as you can see, this is very, very new in terms of exploring. But you have to describe it, well, is this a lead or is this all those different types of ice flows? Then you can start to use these fractional areas and these definitions. So what, uh, what, what we did to um, start to explore that is uh, there's an Army Cold Research Laboratory in, uh, near, near Dartmouth University in New Hampshire. It's essentially an Olympic-sized swimming pool in a, meat, in a meat locker. So we bring down the temperatures to these god-awful temperatures, uh, just cold. And we change the temperature depending on if we don't want ice to form anymore, if we do want ice to form anymore, but we had to maintain it, and it uh, turns out to be very challenging. But the objectives, and we should, probably should blow it up, but the tank was heavily instrumented. It had ADCPs, aquadops, high resolution profilers, turbulence sensors, time of flight velocity sensors, uh, metrological systems, infrared camera, a surface laser for heating, Profiling CTDs, CTDs, <laughs> measurements of nitrous oxide, SF6, oxygen, and Tim can go on with the mass spec measurements that he did of his gases. So the way we if you kind of hone in on the system, and, and I'll show the facility um, in the real case. Uh, this is a, you know, just one picture. <coughs> but essentially, it was six feet water depth. So we went in, it's kind of like evacuating the bay, going to put your tripods in, making sure they're perfect, and then filling the bay up. That's how we um, controlled this. The problem next is we put in about seven tons of, uh, of salt. That's a lot, it's, it's a lot. And, uh, and, uh, and then it we had to wait like three weeks for it to dissolve. And then you have to wait 10 days to bring down the temperature of the water to freeze. And then when you bring down the temperature of the water to freeze, you still have so much water in the atmosphere that all the cooling system frosts up. And then you have to, then, in the, then the refrigeration system breaks. <coughs> and then you're down for a week for the repair to work. And then you're five months later, you have uh, some results. So here are some pictures. We actually built a wind wave tank over this facility. I'm going to show, I'm going to, I'm going to try and get through, I'm almost done, I'm going to try and show a video of a walkthrough. Yeah. But um, essentially those are the kind of experiments. But the point is, is that we really want to explore a larger scale, larger scale of buoyancy and mixing. So you know you can actually do a buoyancy experiment there where you have a very cold and then you essentially warm up the room and then you, you, change the, you can change the heat flux that way. Um, so this is um, pancake ice, and uh, this is, uh, you know, my intern, when I wasn't there, said I didn't expect that one. This is the case where the fan, the low pressure side of the fan is just, you know, causing uh, freezing to take place, and that's, you know, sort of sh shut down the system. So I I'm remotely watching the wind speed in the wind wave tank, and I'm like, did you change the wind speed to zero? And they're like, no. And then a little bit later, they found that the coverage of the intake of the fan was um, frozen. So this is uh, looking up the tank. <coughs> it's two anemometers. This anemometer, and this is a, a slushy field. So okay, we, we did five months of experiments. And the first experiment was we, we finally got things to work, so we froze the whole surface. The next thing that they did, and I didn't, was they cut up the ice into about one meter um, square blocks. So they're on the ice with a big ice cutter, looks like a pavement cutter that you cut the pavements in town, and they sat on the ice and they cut it up, so it began this big ice flow. And there was your problem that you um, expressed, which sometimes it packed, sometimes it had a hard time going through the tank. Uh, I had one, one instrument that was sitting too close to the surface, and you know the, the thousand pound block of ice came and uh, took it down. So it, uh, it, it, these are new conditions. Uh, these things were, you know, became freezing. It's kind of like a little bit of unnatural because in, at least in, the, in nature, it's like always cold, the moisture is low. But when you go from a high moisture system and then it's suddenly cold, you wreak a lot of, of habit and damages. So in this case here, it's, it's, a, it's a slushy event. So 
the, the whole tank we partitioned into different ice fields. We took it out to change the fraction of ice cover. And then the last three weeks of the experiment, we cut different um, holes that are stationary holes. So the whole tank was, was blocked with ice. So there was no exchange there. And there was only like 15% ice cover uh, in that small section. Experimentally, it was great for me because it was this vast reservoir of CO2 charged system that didn't change because it wasn't losing gas. It was only losing gas over a small little area. So was, I could keep the, the constant CO2 value while exchanging over this area. So the wind came down the channel, three centimeter um, anemometer and seven, seven, seven centimeter anemometer. I also measured gradients of CO2, gradients of water vapor, which was really low. <laughs> the numbers that we probably don't even, even have a form of it. The water vapor here, you know, the number would be like 28. Here it was about two or three in terms of the mass. And then we did temperature gradients as well. So those gradients um, over the ice field, I could get uh, fluxes. And this is very close to the end and uh, probably shouldn't put a, a, a equation slide like this, but I just want to show just where I manipulate the system where I can get the, the gas flux by looking at a concentration gradient, the heat flux by looking at temperature, and the other part of the heat flux using the water vapor, and the momentum flux um, using those gradients in the, in the tank. So you're able to, instead of using a mass balance, you can really go after all those fluxes. And the heating was very difficult, really. You can't do a heat balance, but I was able to get both the latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux off of this very cold system in the ice field. So with that, this is a, a set of parameters. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a, a lot of work to get in this case. So going back, here is K, gas transfer velocity. Here's wind speed down that channel. What we're looking at is, is varying the wind speeds and then changing the pump speeds. So, so the, the one component of, of that system was there's pumps underwater, which, which two fried in on cases. But the pumps, this 60, 40, 25 correspond to frequency of the pumps. I can tell you this is about 20 centimeter um, per second um, flows of the water. And the pump five was like two or three centimeters per second uh, flows. But the point is that this monotonic increase when you have a lot of pumps with wind speed, so the, the, the low um, offset for gas exchange is high. The other end of, of it is when you have changes when essentially there was no mixing taking place with the pump, so you have the canonical going down to zero. So what this does is, this is one lead system, we did several leads, we had different ice flows. This is one part of the parameter space where we can really see large changes in the gas transfer velocity with different interactions of the current flow under the ice and with different wind fields. So it starts to set up a parameter space when you have gas exchange and icy systems with different heat fluxes and different types of leads and flow fields. So that's my last data slide. I'm gonna show a quick video of a walkthrough through the facilities and um, end it there. This is a shorter one. It's uh, before the ice was freezing. I can show a quick one. So this is going into the meat locker. Massive cooling systems on the ceiling. It's just the reservoir. It's, 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 it's cooling, so there's a little bit of a foggy effect in the atmosphere. That's the beginning of the, uh, the wind wake. It's a gas equilibration chamber where you can really spike up the concentration of the gases and then put it into the, um, into the large reservoir. Here's that fan and here's the mixing box. So part of the system, so the, the wind wave tank goes off from that. I'm going to walk down the facility now. So here's the, the roof of the wind wave tank here. So this was built just for this experiment. 